Now we identify the fourth key control for temperatures on our surface, and that's land and water heating differences, which is due to the simple fact that land and water respond much different to that incoming solar radiation and absorb and store energy much differently. Uh, so the key idea here, key point, water bodies help to moderate temperature patterns. You don't have as high as highs, you don't have as low as lows. Subsequently, continental areas, large land masses, tend to have an extreming in their temperature patterns. And so those places along a water body are not going to have a very big change in their temperature throughout the day or throughout the year compared to a place that's at the same latitude, same elevation, but deep within a continent. They're going to have a much higher high and a much lower low. Key to understanding, this is the most important thing I'll say on this slide, probably on this video lecture 2.7, is the simple idea. Land heats up but cools down faster than water. Why is that? Well, we'll find out right now. We return to our global temperature range map, showcasing the temperature uh, difference between the January or the uh, or the low temperature uh, versus the high temperature, typically July. So it compares January versus July. And so those places with a very big change, very big difference between their high, uh, their coldest month and their warmest month are showcased as gray. Uh, the places with very little change are showcased as white and uh, green and yellow in between. Very ugly map. I didn't make it. Uh, but some things we note. First off, we go ahead and put our, our good friends, uh, the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn. There we can see, once again, the idea we've talked about beforehand regarding cloudless areas having uh, bigger changes throughout the day. Uh, but if we look deep within the continents, inside those blue circles, we think the deepest we could go within a continent in North America would be somewhere in northern Canada. The deepest we can go inside the continent of Asia is somewhere there in central uh, Russia. And those are two places that have a very big temperature temperature range uh, throughout the year. However, if we look right here along uh, the North Atlantic, where we find once again London, much of Western Europe, you actually find that there's you know, a very minimal change uh, throughout the year. And this makes sense because these are places that are along a water body. These are places that are going to be influenced by the moderating temperatures uh, that we would find along a, long, a large water uh, body like the North Atlantic. Uh, and so once again, understanding the differences. Why is it the fact that London uh, is actually has a, you know, a warmer uh, winter period than Montreal, even though they're at the same latitude and relatively the same elevation. Key to understanding that is uh, the fact that England, uh, United Kingdom, is, is along a water body where Montreal is deeper within a continent. Uh, and so we can see these patterns mirrored on both sides. Uh, but for the most part, another thing to note is the fact that these global temperature ranges are, are we see these greens and grays much more up in the northern part of the of the world, and that's because we have more land masses. Uh, and so the northern hemisphere is also referred to as the land hemisphere. The southern hemisphere also referred to as the water hemisphere. And so, of course, where we have these large land masses, we're going to have very you know bigger fluctuations, whereas places. Uh, in the southern hemisphere, which is more overwhelmingly water, we don't have much of a difference at all. Long slide, but well worth it. As we explain why land and water heat differently, we have three key reasons, three key temperature controls. Evaporation, transparency, and movement. First, evaporation. Uh, of course, a water body, we're going to have a much more uh, likelihood of evaporation occurring uh, than a big old land mass because this is the change from a liquid to a gas state. So water turns to water vapor. One characteristic, though, of evaporation is at the surface, you would expect cooling. One way we note this, if you get out of the pool on a hot summer afternoon in Indiana, uh, you get out of the pool, and one of the things is you get out and you're all, uh, you kind of get the chills. Uh, you might get the goosebumps. What's happening is that water on your skin is evaporating. And so what's happening at the surface of your skin, cooling, thus giving you those chills and uh, the goosebumps. Uh, so evaporation, if you think about it, well, this is a process that overwhelmingly uh, lands, land masses aren't going to be moderated by. Uh, and so if you think about in the warm summer period during that intense evaporation period, Water, big water uh, bodies, water masses, they don't uh, have that high temperature because of evaporation helping to cool the surface, uh, which we would find uh, over a large water body. And 84% of evaporation on Earth occurs in our oceans. Second up would be transparency. Transparency, the simple idea that solid ground, land is opaque, uh, whereas water is transparent or clear. Uh, the very simple idea here. Uh, so the solid ground, surface, a landmass, 
only the extreme top level of that surface is going to feel uh, that insulation. It's going to absorb that insulation. Whereas water, uh, because of its characteristics, it's clear, uh, essentially, uh, the incoming solar radiation can penetrate deeper. So essentially that insulation, same amount, is getting spread over a greater area, whereas in the case of solid ground, it's only that very, very top layer. Uh, and so one of the things we got we can relate to is if you go to the beach. Uh, if you go to the beach in the summertime, let's say, let's go somewhere in Florida. Uh, during the summertime, you're walking on uh, on the sand. Uh, one of the things, if you, if you know, in the, you know, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that sand's super hot. And if you're walking around barefoot, you're probably, ooh, 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 ee, ah, ah. I mean, it's hurting your feet. But then all of a sudden, if you just dig your toes in a little bit deeper, uh, underneath that top level of soil, that's probably that top level of sand, you notice it's actually quite cool. It's actually a good way to cool your feet quickly. And that's because only the top level of the surface is being uh, absorbed or is being exposed to that incoming solar radiation. And so here's another way to showcase the idea that water heats and cools sluggishly. And so it takes a longer time for it to heat up, but also it takes a longer time for it to cool down because of that insulation being spread over a greater area. Third and final key reason for uh, land and water heating differences is movement. Simple idea, ocean waters are constantly mixing. So you have cooler waters mi mixing with warmer waters helping to moderate the temperatures. Uh, so water heats slowly because it mixes with cooler, deeper water. So you have the surface and you have all this blending and mixing happening. Land masses, of course, they don't have this, this, this uh, effect. Of course, we've got plate tectonics. I, you know, land is moving, uh, but there's not that mixture at all. And so movement would be our, three key, or sorry, our third key reason for uh, land water water temperature differences on Earth's surface. So now we get to have some names we can attach to these key ideas, the first being the marine effect or the maritime effect. Uh, so places that are along a water body or along an ocean are going to be more influenced by it and thus going to have uh, less of a range in their temperatures throughout the year. Whereas places that have high continentality or have are deep within the continent are going to be affected by what we call the continental effect. Uh, so, of course, these are going to be areas less affected by the sea, i.e. Indiana. Um, you know, for a little bit, you know, you could say that northern part of the state is affected by Lake Michigan, uh, but overwhelmingly deep within the continent here in Indiana, uh, we are more exposed to high continentality. Uh, so we're going to have variations in our temperatures. Uh, if you don't believe me, st you know, stick around through a winter here in Indiana and come back in the summertime. Uh, you'll notice a very big temperature change throughout the seasons, uh, throughout the year. Uh, and so another idea is we've got this greater range between the max and the min temperatures throughout the year, the high temperature, the low temperature, but that's also throughout the days as well. Uh, so continental places are also going to have higher highs and lower lows. One way to illustrate this is uh, in, uh, on June 23rd, I got out my iPhone and looked at the temperature in Indianapolis. The high temperature was 101 degrees, the low temperature was 72 degrees. I looked at Key West, Florida, which is essentially deep uh, in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, all stuck out there all, all by itself. Uh, and so it's going to be heavily affected by the maritime effect. There, the high temperature was 83, the low temperature was 81. One way we can showcase this is with our two good friends, Vancouver, British Columbia, up in Canada, just north of Seattle, and Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, they're just north of North Dakota and Minnesota, up in Canada. And one of the things we know is we can compare British Columbia, which is right there along the Pacific Ocean, and Winnipeg deep within the continent. We can see the temperature range. Over on the left-hand side, Vancouver, it doesn't change as much. It's not as high of a fluctuation. Even further, if we look at this, there's no months below the freezing point. And so here we are, we're in Canada, we have a place that's actually where it never really gets below uh, the freezing uh, freezing point for long periods of time, whereas Winnipeg, Manitoba, over here on the right hand side, has a you know has four or five months in which uh, the temperature is below the freezing point. So here we hear, we see on the left hand side the maritime effect, and on the right hand side the continental effect. Same goes for San Francisco and Wichita, Kansas. San Francisco, one of the things I've heard is there's never you've never experienced a cold night like you have in summer in San Francisco. And so one of the things is San, San Francisco in the summertime, it's actually not that really great of a place to go visit. However, during the wintertime, it's a little bit better because temperatures are pretty much in the 50s uh, for most of the year compared to Wichita, Kansas, which has a very, very big fluctuation from their high temperature and their low temperature. Right after this uh, video lecture, I've added a uh, narrated uh, description of this uh, map here. Essentially, summarizes all the things we've talked about in this uh, entire video lecture 2 series.